What's cracking, you little gold digging gravity addicts? We're about to get into this episode. Oh, Daddy's showing a little upper echelon right there. I want you guys to take a strong hit off your own undercarriage and fill your lungs with some nut courage. Because this week we're talking about hitchhiking, finding part of a hand in the woods. We got a caller who introduces us to the world of leglessness and all you've ever wanted to know about that. And could a Red Bull truck driver be the next Vincent Van Gogh? We're about to Vincent find out. Welcome to This Past Weekend. This Past Weekend. All right, welcome to This Past Weekend. I am Theo Vaughn, and thank you guys very, very much for joining me. I know this is your time, and you are choosing to spend it here with me on Monday, June's uh, 12. And we are here getting lively into the summertime where the heat uh, starts to come looking for you. And there are times in the year when you got to go looking for the heat. You know, you might fly off to the beach or you might you might um, take the laundry outside to let the, you know, get the water out of it. But these are times right now when the heat comes looking for you. And I'm hot. I'm hot for you right now, whoever you are. I'm fired up, man. I'm happy to be here with you guys today. I'm feeling fortunate uh, to be alive, and I'm glad that we're about to share a little bit of time together. I spent my weekend in Calusa. Or Friday night, I was in Calusa, Calusa Casino, and that's uh, north of Sacramento, I believe, about an hour. Um, and it's good people out there. You know, it's just a lot of farm people, it's rural, um, a lot of animals, animal feces, and poop, and. Um, fertilizer, crops, uh, pecan groves, uh, walnuts, uh, orchards, stuff like that. A lot of fertilizer, spray rigs, things like that. You know, a lot of people with um, burns on their skin from miscellaneous fertilizer errors and things like that. Nature, human nature happening and happening out there and I had a good time and I was happy to be there and uh and just good people man you know lesbians regular lesbians you know not the not the furious ones that uh that hate men uh, just regular regular lesbians uh, families family values uh, and some good diversity out there as well a lot of latinos mexicans um indian there's a strong indian population as well out there and everything was going just handily I felt like and I was happy to be there. We had a show at Calusa Casino, and everybody had a, had, a, had a good time. I want to thank you guys for coming out. So we'll start right there, and we'll, I want to thank you for coming out and, and, and taking a look at this bad little mother spitter right here, you know, coming out there and smelling my loud breath that was coming off that microphone. We had a crowd of about four or 500 out there, and it was sheer joy. Uh, I got to my accommodations out there. A man picked me up at the airport at that Sacramento Air Central. And I took a ride out to the, the casino. And this fella talked. He was chatty. You know, they got chatty Cathy's out there. This was a chatty Carl. This man knew words. This man knew words. He's not a, he's not a fella you want to... He's not really a guy you... If you, if you got trapped in a, on an island with him, you'd probably kill him early. And it's, it's not even a knock against him. Some people just have that infection of, um, of, in, of chattership, of talkativeness, where they just want to ramble off and just show you they know all the letters and show you they know how to match all the letters up and make word magic. And this gentleman was no different than that. Uh, very chatty man. Nice guy. Uh, a murder had actually taken place up there recently. I'm a big murder guy. You know, I've, I've always been... I've always been fond of murder and treasure, you know, murder and buried treasure. Yeah, I watch murder television. I mean, I honestly, I can't even sleep sometimes at night without knowing that there's a new murder that I don't know about. That's where I'm at with it. Maybe I would call it an addiction a little bit, but I get keyed up, you know, with the crimes and the mystery and the buried treasure. I've always thought of myself as a treasure hunter who doesn't have time to do his craft. But maybe in the future, I get me a strong wife and I get out there and I find a something. You know, I, I don't know if I find anything that's nothing underwater. I'm not doing all that crazy shit looking out under the water. You know, I'm no 
I'm not, I'm not extraterrestrial. I'm not um, aquatanious, but I am a man who will get out there in the hard dirt and look for, you know, Indian burial grounds or some type of local treasure, buried cash. But I'm here with you guys uh, right now. We had a good time out in Calusa, man. I got settled out there. And this was interesting. I remember I walked out of the, the lodging at the casino. And there's a beautiful little casino out there. And and the, the man who dropped me off, we'd been talking. They had a murder that happened up there recently. A young lady went missing. They found her body. And so the second I got into the car, I was asking him about that. And he knew one of the guys who'd been accused of it. So I was a little bit roped in. But I think I asked three questions, and this gentleman had three million words. So his answer to question ratio is is off the charts. It was a bit much. But I got settled in, and then I went out looking. They had a parade in the town, in the town of Calusa, a small parade, and I wanted to go see it. You know, I like stuff like that, Americana parades, um, children riding sheep or lambs. Sometimes they have these events at the rodeo where they'll put a couple of children, they'll tie them onto a sheep, you know, a small child, or a, they'll tie them onto to an athletic lamb and let the action take place and the crowd goes wild and, you know, people are drinking their orange drinks or they're, you know, sipping whiskey or secret drinks that they're keeping in their coats. And you get to see these children riding these lambs. And it's um, it's beautiful, man. It's nice to see the juxtaposition between a a a a malleable child that can bounce around and a and a scared athletic sheep or lamb um it's fun to watch if you have never gotten to see that but i walked uh outside to the valet area and they had four employees working out there and i was like oh, i want to catch an uber into town and the guy's like i don't know if we have any ubers that come here if you want one you have to get one from sacramento uh, Sacramento is an hour away. That's where I just came in from. And I'm thinking, well, what the fuck? You know, I can't, I can't get an Uber from, to come get me here to take me four miles into the town to see the parade. So then he's like, well, you should walk. And I'm like, walk, dude, I'm not, there's no sidewalks, you know? Like I'll get, I'll be a freelance trotter. You know, I'll get out there, but you know, it's getting around sunset. I just didn't know if it was ideal. And also, what kind of advice is this guy giving? This guy's the valet. He's telling me to walk out there, you know? There's no sidewalk. He's like, we got a guy that walks to work. And I'm like, yeah, you've probably had 20 guys that walk to work, but 19 of them have been hit by cars or murdered. I mean, if you're walking next to a busy highway and I'm a murderer and I see you, I mean, think about that. I know a lot of you guys listening are not murderers, you know? And I know that, and I'm happy. I'm happy about that, and that brings me joy. But think about the fact that you're driving, and you are a murderer, okay? You've murdered, you know, and whatever, and whatnot. And you got journals about it and shit like that. You're in the game. And you see a dang hitchhiker or somebody walking by themselves. I mean, it's not going to take long for whatever it is inside of you that, that finds joy in killing others to flare up. So here you got these valets telling me if I want to get into town to walk. It's only four miles. So that seemed a little bit dangerous to me. That didn't seem like, you know, uh, concierge type chatter. You know, you'd think they'd have other ways. And I was like, well, you probably had 20 people that walked to work, but a decent amount of them been hit by cars or, or probably killed by someone. So one of the other young fellas out there pipes up. He goes, well, why don't you ask somebody for a ride? And I'm in it. And I know he's talking about hitchhiking. And hitchhiking, I don't know if anybody's ever hitchhiked, I've done it, and I've picked up a few, and I'll tell you about that shortly, but uh, this gentleman's saying hitchhike, and hitchhiking is basically like you getting into someone's car, and it's kind of like, it's almost like, okay, who's going to murder who? That's sort of the first moment when you get in. It's like, is this dude going to kill me, or am I going to flare up and kill this dude, you know? Uh, hitchhiking, extremely dangerous. People, I think it's one of the reasons they outlawed it, because people were getting killed all the time doing it, you know? Uh, my experiences with uh, hitchhiking or thumbing, you know, are, well, one time I picked up a black family, a, a father and a, and a mother and a child, middle of the night. They were at an abandoned vehicle, took them into town to get gasoline brought them back they didn't say thank you they did not say thank you i thought that was kind of shit dude you know no thanks i mean no thanks at all 
And I'd, well, I'd like to say to them right now, you're welcome, brother. You are welcome, you little, you couple of titty imps, because I brought you home. You know, I got you set up and that, not even say thank you. Another time I picked up a senior, you know, senior citizen, and I have a pension for seniors. I have a soft spot in my heart and um, and in my brain. I just, if you were, if you could walk into my brain, you'd see a lot of seniors sitting around and doing chess and checkers and laughing and, you know, eating pudding or eating soft snacks and sharing stories with each other about the good days. Because I have a pension for seniors. You know, my father was born in 1910. So I've always had that, you know, that extracurricular love for something in its, in its old age, you know, something that's getting old. Um, and I picked up a senior hitchhiker, man. And he told me, this is a, a story he told me, this hitchhiker. He told me once he was out there thumbing and somebody picked him up and they start cruising and he noticed that a policeman follows him and then another one and the sirens are going. And then he realizes that the guy who picked him up is in a high speed chase from the police. And he asks the guy, he's like, well, why'd you pick me up? And the guy tells him because he didn't want to die alone. That's what he told him. Can you imagine that? You're just hiking, man. You're just trying to get somewhere. Somebody picks you up. Because they don't want to die alone. That's how wild it's going to get. And then fast forward, I guess, about 50 miles, the guy said they ended up lodged. The car was lodged in a cornfield somewhere, and the cops got him. And uh, and once he told them what had happened, they ended up letting him go. But that's a wild hitchhiker story. And that man actually had a cold beer, I remember, in his pocket. And I thought that that was, um, that that was interesting, for me anyway. So, so yeah, they wanted me to hitchhike up there. They wanted me to to walk basically at Calusa Casino. I'm like, you guys would have more gamblers if you guys weren't sending them off to get murdered around here. And this is murder. It's murder country up there. This is it's an environment where you could see people go missing. There's a lot of good places to hide people. But thank you guys for joining me today, man. Um, we got we got some cool calls. We had some people called uh, based on the follow up about female breadwinners. We got some amputees that called in, and um, we're, I'm excited to get into that to delve into that and learn a little bit about it. Uh, first, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more. Um, while we're on the topic of murder, I've been watching these murder shows. You know, uh, I've always been big into them. I don't know when I was a child, my mother made us watch them a lot. You know, and that's what we watched. We watched America's Most Wanted as a family. And other shows like that where people were murderers or missing and stuff. And, and it's a fascinating time for this kind of stuff. It's extremely popular in America, you know. And, uh, and when I was young, actually, a child, they even had a criminal who was uh, hiding in the woods behind our house. And I didn't know he was a criminal. You know, and I'd sneak back there and get him, you know, I'd take him, um, you know, canned sodas and, and apples and, and uncooked spaghetti and packages of stuff that I knew my mother wouldn't be upset if it was missing. And I thought he was honestly just some lady's husband that had, you know, been a bad husband or hadn't been good at husbanding. And the, the wife had sent him out for a while or he'd spent time out because he wasn't doing a good job in his husband role. And because I used to see a lot of men would go park behind the Wind Dixie, a lot of troubled husbands and angry husbands would park behind the Wind Dixie, which is a regional grocer, and they would stay back there and um, in their trucks and sleep in their trucks, and you'd see them back there, you know, chewing plug tobacco and smoking cigarettes and pleasuring themselves a lot of time, doing self touch and you know playing touchy touch in there in the truck in the cab of the truck. Um, and we'd go ride our bikes up there and yell at them if they were sleeping or something and fire them up. But this man was a criminal, and I didn't know he was a criminal at the time. I just thought he was Keith. His name was Keith, and I called him Dirty Keith in my head, but I didn't say that to him because he was strong. And I got scared of him a lot. And he, he would pick me up and hold me in the air above his head, you know, kind of Lion King in me. And it made me really scared. But also he was nice to me and he would chat with me and we'd sit back there and I would just, you know, bring him different delectables and stuff like that. And then police came a couple of weeks later, door to door and asking if anybody knew a criminal was hiding. And at that point, I didn't want to not know that he was a criminal. I felt ashamed for not knowing. I just thought he was a, you know, a husband that wasn't doing great. And I told them 
I told him, yeah, I knew it was a criminal and I'd been, you know, giving him canned goods and stuff like that and stuff like that. And so that was kind of a wild time uh, for me dealing with, you know, miscreants and, and crime, I guess. Another thing that happened when I was young, I found a couple fingers in the woods, a peace sign kind of. I don't know if you've ever, if you look at your hand, if you give somebody a peace sign, you give them that second and third finger in from the thumb. And I remember a buddy of mine and I were in the woods one time looking for cans because they had an aluminum setup where you turned in the aluminum and they gave you money because these people were, I don't know what they were collecting aluminum for, but... Somebody said they were building a castle or something like that, and you know, a metal castle or something for the government. And this is back when aliens were big, and so you you weren't surprised that the government was out there, you know, paying light money for aluminum and metals, metals, different types of metals. And we found a peace sign. Literally, somebody had gotten part of their their hand cut off, the two fingers, and the base of them. You know, like um, broccoli kind of has that base. If you get a little. Uh, a little thing of broccoli it has that base before it goes out into the, uh, the the flower part and it had that little chunk you know the knuckles there and then it had the two fingers and we found it was in the woods and we told a man that lived near there that ran a little snack outlet he ran like a snowballs and crackers or something like that you know and a lot of the brothers and sisters it was on the edge of an urban neighborhood and a lot of the brothers and sisters would congregate over there and you know, drink lemon drinks and have snacks. And we'd get over there sometimes. And uh, and we told him about the, the fingers, and he called the police, and somebody came and got them, put them in a bag and took them, and we never heard anything about it again. But I remember after that, uh, in church, people would say, peace be with you. And I thought that, that that had something to do with this peace sign, and it always made me nervous. I'm like, what does it mean? What does it mean? Um, and I, I had an affinity, I guess, for people that were missing fingers. My father was missing a finger when he was young. One of his siblings slammed a door on his, his, I think his middle finger and, um, and he didn't have it when I met him, when I met him, he didn't have that. He had nine. He was running on nine. And so I was eternally looking for somebody who was missing those two fingers, missing that peace sign, you know, but, uh, but I've come to the conclusion that's why people get killed in some of these rural areas is because there's bad valets and there's just ignorance. I mean, here were two young fellas, and I had a great time at the casino, good people. But here's a couple of valets, you know, in concierges. These people are supposed to be directing me, and they're telling me to walk. You know, I'm entertaining people in a couple hours. They're telling me to walk four miles, basically sending me off to my death, presumably. I mean, because if once you start to hitchhike, man, you are destined... You're destined for trouble usually, you know? And so I felt like I was destined for that. But I had a great time there, a great crowd. Uh, thank you for that support. <clears throat> thank you very much for that support. And uh, speaking of support, actually, I'll tell you this, dude. I, when well, I'm going to let y'all know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in New York City coming up on uh, two weekends, Gotham Comedy Club. Then I'll be in Stark County, Illinois. That's a fundraiser. I'll be in Nashville July 8th and 9th. I need your support there. They're giving me a test run at this theater there at this at the Zanies Comedy Club. So come out, tell your friends if you have them in Nashville. I'd love to have your support. Then I'll be in Orlando, San Diego, Addison, near Dallas, Austin, and Cleveland all in the next four months. You can find those tickets at theovon.com slash tour. I've got two albums on iTunes, and we're starting a Patreon account this week. So that'll be later in the week. I think on the 14th, we're going to go live uh, with some neat stuff that people are excited about uh, to be involved in this past weekend. A lot of neat stuff. Thinking about doing this investigative murder type of podcast as well, um, but we'll see. We'll see about that. So that's what I've been up to, man. You know, that's what I've been, you know, I didn't get murdered out there, and I'm grateful for that. And here I am with you today. And I hope you guys are just, I hope your nuts are warm or your, you know, your ovaries are freaking firing on all cylinders and you guys are out there making the most of the beginning of this week. There's a lot going on. Summer solstice is coming. You know, things are happening in the air and you got to hold your own. Keep your neck up. You know, I remember there was a time, I've always wanted my neck to be longer and I've shared this with you guys. But I used to wear a neck brace at night for about eight months trying to grow my neck out because I saw some kids in Africa or these women in Africa had really long necks and they had these stacked, these kind of rings on them, but 
it just made my neck hurt a lot and it made it so I couldn't hear that good for a little while because I think it did something bad to my ears. Anyhow, let's get into the news. Uh, NBA Finals, it's happening. And to me, it's boring, man. And to me, this whole season has been boring. I've talked about it a little bit. But my thought is that if the NBA, and that means National Basketball Association, if their goal is to make a money-making good product, then I don't think they've succeeded. If their goal is to make a good business, then yes, they're making money, no doubt about it. But to me, it's more like the WWE these days. You know, you don't feel like it's real. There's only a couple people that can win it. And the diversity level is wah, wah to me. To me, the diversity level. I'd love to see more diversity in the NBA. You know, more white players, Viet, Asian, Poly, Grecian, Mexican. You know, if I'm watching the game and I see a player that's like me, I think I would feel more connected. Do you feel that way? What do you think? You know, uh, I'm, 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 I'm always happy to have my views adjusted uh, by someone who comes along with better ideas. But you telling me that you don't want to see Guillermo Gomez fire off a 50-foot three-pointer? You know, a beautiful Mexican gentleman at 5'1", firing off a 50-foot three-pointer, wearing Dickies pants or overalls like he does every day on his lunch, br lunch break out here in Los Angeles? Come on. Mexican players love Mexican people, Mexican guys love basketball, and I'd, uh, I'd like to see them represented in the NBA, man, you know, and I'd love to see our first Asian coach. I just want to see a little more diversity. I think, uh, I think the game's gotten a little boring to me. Politics, man. Just got this story. Three Trump students at Wall Township High School, I'm going to read this one here, in New Jersey opened their yearbooks to find that their, their Trump-supporting t-shirts had been edited out of their photos. They looked like basic posters you would see for a campaign, These the, their t-shirts. Nothing fancy, nothing negative. And I'm not sure if the school did this, you know. Um, like, it seems like whoever ran the yearbook kind of did this, you know. It didn't go against school policy, and the, the, the principals and the officials there said that they're, gonna, they're definitely going to look into it. But I'm thinking if that were me as a child, whatever your political affiliation is, it doesn't matter. But if I... I'd be upset, man, because that's my yearbook picture. That's the only picture you have to take from the age 18 and under that needs to be what you want it to be because that's the one they're going to go back to. You go to jail, boom, they go back to that one. You, uh, you pass away somehow, maybe if you're hitchhiking in the town from Calusa Casino, boom, they go back to that one. And you, you dress special for that. You wear something you know that you want. You know, that's legend shit, man. You know, whether you're wearing a, a vanilla ice t-shirt or that Z Cavaricci pants, whatever you had on, I remember in my yearbook photo, I didn't want it to be adjusted. You know, a lot of children back in the day wore these Big Johnson t-shirts. And Big Johnson was a, a synonym for cock or penis or something, you know, large, you know, gonads and dick and all. And they had these people would wear these shirts. And it was always like a man with like a big hose and it's like Big Johnson puts out the fires, you know. And it was always um, metaphorical, these shirts. But if I'd have worn my Big Johnson shirt to yearbook and they'd have edited that out, I'd have been upset. And it just made me think a little bit about freedom of speech, man. And it's something that I'm noticing in America that freedom of speech, it's allowed, totally. But the publication of free speech feels limited. Because the publishers of a lot of media, they're not publishing people's views that are different or th that are different than their own or that aren't in line with theirs. And I don't know if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. But if you got some thoughts on that, hit the hotline, man. Do you think that freedom of speech is still where it always has been? Maybe I'm crazy. And it seemed to me, this is my last political thought here, but it's been, I don't even know if there's Republicans and Democrats anymore. It seems almost more like there's mainstream media versus like the populist party, you know? It seems like you have mainstream media versus like farmers or versus, you know, people like that. Yeah, mainstream media versus populist party. That's what it seems like to me. Those are just some thoughts, man. And that's all the news, man. I'm not getting into it that much. You know, and I'm going to try to stay less political on this thing, man. I'm not trying to turn anybody off, but I do get, you know, I do worry about freedom of speech, man, because 
you know, no one should feel like they can't speak up. Nobody should. That's a tough place to be for anyone. Um, and it's hard to feel uh, whether you're in a classroom or a college or uh, you're at your place of work or anything to feel like you can't express your beliefs, even just in curiosity, because I'm always happy to be wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. I don't have to be right, but I do have to be able to ask questions and and explain my case because perspectives are different, you know, and so people with different perspectives are going to have different views. Uh, and I understand a man. I understand how people can have certain perspectives in one place and certain perspectives in another. All right, man, let's get into some missing limbs, dude. I had some great calls this week. I'm going to try, I've had a lot of calls about uh, addiction and I want to get into that. Um, I'm going to Thursday, I'm going to try to do a follow-up that's just about addiction. I just wanted to address some of the the people that have called with with questions about addiction. Um, You know, that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, Personally, coming up on 11 months here sober and uh, feeling really grateful for that. But I was excited, man. I've always been fascinated uh, by people that are missing limbs or the unique. I call them the unique. And people's, you know, the word unicorn... I'd rather it be a unique corn because that's the thing about a unicorn is that it's unique. And I love the unique, man. I remember even as a child, um, you know, I went to second grade and they had a boy in my class that had a stutter. And a stutter is when your mouth and your brain, you know, suddenly are like just remixing words and, you know, dropping the beat you know, right in the middle of a sentence and stuff like that. And so your brain's a little bit wild. But I remember meeting this boy who had a stutter and I immediately was just enamored with this fellow. I was infatuated because he was different than me. You know, he had this this unique thing, this unique thing that I didn't have, that I couldn't even really create. And I would try to impersonate him constantly, not out of making fun. I had no issue. I had no desire to make fun of him. I was just... He was a unique corn to me. He was interesting, you know, and I wanted to know a little bit more about what was going on in his life, you know. Uh, And so that's why I asked people to call in who were missing limbs or missing appendages, because that's kind of fascinating to me. I've always had my arms and legs, you know, these are my arms and I'm showing on you on the YouTube. I'm showing you right now. I got two arms and got hear that sound. That's me patting on both of my legs. But. Do I have I always felt like I'll be fully armed and legged my whole life? No, and that's an honest thing, man. Uh, I've never considered myself a candidate for full life um, armadry and legadry. I've always considered myself, you know, somebody that could lose something or be missing something. You know, I'm absent minded. You know, I I could easily see it. You know, I've had flare-ups, uh, close calls in the past. I used to uh, cut lumber with this fellow who was mentally challenged when I was doing farm work over there outside of uh, Natchez, Mississippi. And he lined the chainsaw up on my leg and almost cut it off one time. He thought it was a piece of wood. So that guy was an idiot, but it almost happened to me. That's what I'm saying, you know. I've never felt like my arms and legs would be with me always. Um, and if you consider yourself a candidate or somebody that's going to have their arms and legs their whole life, that's kind of wild to me. I think that's you being pretty cocky, don't you? You know, it's pretty cocky to assume that you're going to have your arms and legs your entire life. You're going to have them forever just because you've had them for a few years so far, you know. And so I've been curious as to what that universe is like. You know, is it scary? You know, do you feel handicapped? Do you uh, do you just adapt? You know, I've suffered from a uh, depression over the years, and it's more manageable these days, but it's it's not always perfect, for sure. You know, and I've let my depression get me down and beat me down and enslave me at times, even. You know, and I've you know I've this it's been my amistad at times, um, and I'm currently fully you know able bodied. Uh, but I don't know if I always will be. And I wonder what it's like for a lot of those people. And we got a, we had some, uh, some people reach out through the hotline. And I want to drop that hotline number on you really quick, uh, just in case you don't have it, that Google Voice number. And that is 985. 
Hold on, guys, it's coming. That is 985-664-9503. If you have any comments on anything we've been discussing uh, that are brought up, I'd love for you to hit the hotline and share it with me or any other um, questions or inquiries that you have that you want basic life suggestions on. So let's hit this call right here. Uh, This gentleman was calling in. Uh, This is Patrick. Uh, Let's hear from Patrick. See yo, what's going on? It's Patrick Wells calling in from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, you wanted people to call in who are missing an appendage. That's me, my man. I'm missing uh, my uh, my right leg. I had uh, cancer twice. Second time, they had to amputate that. But first and foremost, my man, we we need to do something with that haircut, okay? You're a grown ass man. We need to get you a, a respectable uh, haircut. I don't know what's going on with your life, but. Uh, I got a dope thing down the block. We can hook you up, man. We need to do something with that bullshit, man. <laughs> okay, man. I feel you, Patrick. You don't like this. You trying to amputate my haircut, huh? I feel you. Um, I appreciate your call, man. I'm growing this out maybe for the bald. You know, I'm trying to represent a little bit, but I do appreciate that. Appreciate your call, man. Um, and I'll, I'll take that into consideration, dude. Let's, let's, uh, let's go onward. You knew better. You do better. Anyway... <laughs> Hold on, I want to hear. I want you guys to hear that part again, right Dope here. Thing down the block, we can hook you up, man. We need to do something with that bullshit, man. If you knew better, you do better. If you knew better, you do better. That's interesting, man. Anyway, second of all, let's talk about uh, having life with one leg, okay? And I'm, I've been missing my leg for 14 years now. So the prosthetic I got weighs 12 pounds. 14 years now to put that into semblance for some of you guys that's um 14 years is the life of a uh, a sheep is lives 15 years on average a fox lives 14 years what else uh bichon some bichons can live 14 years so just to give you guys a timeline um that's 14 years all right and he says it weighs 12 pounds so i've been swinging around a prosthetic that weighs 12 pounds for 14 years that prosthetic so he's been swinging around a prosthetic weighs 12 pounds for 14 years that should be i'm thinking that's almost some type of a record you know it's interesting because they'll have men in these world record contests that are you know holding you know doing bench pressing 225 pounds for you know 20 reps and that's a record or whatever but they don't have a contest where and maybe they should where you you know, for 14 years lugging 12 pounds, that sounds intense to me, man. If I could give you a little medal, I would. Let's go onward. That prosthetic also costs $80,000. So uh, every five years, I have to get a new prosthetic leg, too, because the uh, computer processor goes bullshit. So imagine buying a car for $80,000, Theo, and then them saying, hey, you're going to need to buy a new one in five years damn eighty thousand dollars that's a gucci leg bro 80 80 k i'm surprised you don't get jacked dude if i see car jackers next time i'm gonna be like guys y'all should look into some uh some some prosthetics you know into synthetics we used to live actually not far from our prosthetic dealership and we could smell them heating them up over there and you know these were cheap ones i think back in the day and we'd see them, you know, casing up legs and elbows and all of that shit. But um, onward, let's hear more, man. This is interesting. And thank you for your call, man. It's really interesting. It's uh, it's some bullshit. But uh, I'll- yeah, I'd sleep with a gun. I think then at that point. I mean, how are you gonna fall asleep knowing you got eighty k right there? I mean, what if your wife doesn't like you? I could see her taking you out and just black marketing that leg, especially if after five years you got to get a new one. And then I wonder if, and you could maybe call us back, Patrick, and let me know if you is there an aftermarket? You know, if you if that leg runs you five years and then you're getting rid of it, then what? You know, do you find somebody who don't have that much loot or doesn't have insurance? You know, when you drop that, you know, you drop that, you know, that that appendage on them, or you hook them up with that wheel for a discount. Onward. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, proper staring etiquette whenever you're a handicapped person, mm-hmm. okay? Or, or or if you're a two-legged motherfucker like yourself. <laughs> so when you have two legs and you see somebody with one leg, it's okay to, you know, nod, give a thumbs up, maybe say how you doing, but please, 
please, when you see somebody who's handicapped, don't fucking break your neck. <laughs> don't stop in the middle of what you're doing and see if we're about to fall or if we're about to fuck up. Yeah, I guess yelling timber is like the worst thing you could do. But that's interesting because I feel like, well, let's hear the rest of what you're saying. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Patrick. Onward. I'm telling you, Theo, I get that shit all the time, man. They, they, they look at us like we're fucking, you know, like we're not even human beings. Like, mm. you know, I understand if you're curious, but don't fucking stare. I hate when two-legged people fucking stare like we're fucking idiots. I, I can't stand that shit. So uh, the proper etiquette when you see a handicapped motherfucker, just say, hey, how you doing? If you got questions, feel free to ask, okay? Okay. So that's good, man. I mean, that's proper etiquette. You see a handicapped mf'er you know and your biped that's two legs then just give them a, a nod a thumbs up is pretty cool i like to use that sometimes um or but don't don't try to you know you don't want to stare too much you don't, you don't want to look too much because they don't want to feel marveled at you know and that's interesting and, and also though sometimes and this might just be some some ego thing of mine where I, I feel like I want to try and be supportive somehow or I want to help out. But maybe that's just me feeling like I'm just going to be boosting myself up if I can help someone. Uh, and it's not me taking into account that this person has been living with this injury probably for a long time and they know exactly uh, how to handle themselves. So that's interesting, Patrick. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I also wonder, do you ever feel bionic? And maybe you can call us back with that. Because I think these days, like when I was young, I mean, you'd see, I remember I was uh, I was bussing tables out there in Tucson, Arizona one time. I used to live out there in the sunshine and not a lot of shirt sleeves out there. And a lot of people saw a one-eyed man do cocaine one time out near this orange uh, orchard, out near an orchard for uh, citrus, you know. And he, uh, and... This um, and when I was out there, they had a man on the bus. I used to ride the bus to work, and the city bus. And he had an he had a a leg and appendage, and it was cheaper than what you're riding on. You know, this thing was, it looked like about a four hundred dollar leg or something, probably very low end. You know, I mean, like a damn, it was like a used Tercel. But this thing, he had built an ashtray into the side of it, like one of those old Burger King ashtrays you would see, just the little aluminum ones, and he'd or a place for it, and then he'd kind of glued it or hooked it, super glued it into the side of his leg, and he would cross one leg up over his regular leg, and he'd have it like at an angle, and he'd just use it as an ashtray. It was like a perfectly flat ashtray, and I thought that that was pretty interesting. Uh, to see people do that back then or, you know, do different stunts or whatever with it. I saw a man when I lived over in uh, Santa Monica, he was hiding drugs in his leg. And he had a twist off kind of metal leg, looked very World War II-ish. And I'd see him begging for money. And this guy was a drug addict. He was out there on drugs and had a bunch of American and Japanese flags and a lot of dirt all over him. And he was in a wheelchair and he would twist his legs off and he'd hide drugs in him. I mean, he'd be out there smoking stuff that he had hidden in his legs. And he had a very heavy leg, looked very German, very World War II, very something we'd sell to the enemy, you know, something like that. Some legs we're probably currently selling to Iran or something like that. But uh, anyhow, this, uh, this, 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 this information you're giving me now, it makes me wonder if people don't think that a younger generation, they see more bionic people. You know, they see more, uh, you know, these superheroes and stuff like Iron Man and these different superheroes that can, you know, that part of their bodies are bionic. So I wonder if, if younger people might not stare because they're intrigued almost. They may see you as a, as not someone with a handicap, but someone with a, um, a, like a, dope like whatever the the opposite of a handicap is like a straight up you know like a god i can't think of something like you just you know extraordinary some superpower almost but uh let's keep going unless we look like we're busy doing some shit then then leave us the fuck alone um i'm trying to think of uh what i could tell you about uh you know 
missing a leg, man. You, everything in the world changes. You know, I miss being able to get up in the morning and go and take a piss. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, man. You know? It's really interesting. And I went to bed till I was 30, and so I didn't even a lot of times get up and use that gift that I had to go pee. Um, so I guess that's just a real... That's very lame of me to do that, but it puts it in perspective, man. You know, when you, just the littlest things, how much more effort you have to make. Now, at this point, Patrick's call got cut off. He called right back. So let's tap into the second call from him. See, you know, it's Pat from uh, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, just want to talk to you about that whole uh, uh, one leg shit. Um, first of all, the difference between uh, an above knee amputation and below the knee amputation. Uh-oh, shots fired. Shots fired down here. Now, Patrick's saying there's a difference between they got beef in these leg streets, you know, that they got prosciutto out in these limb streets because there's beef between people that have above leg and below below leg amputations. I didn't know this. Onward. Below the, the amputation, you know, these motherfuckers act like it's the, it's the same shit. It's not the same shit. You know, below the knee, you get the... Go bike ride. You can go fucking rock climbing. Mm -hmm. You can ballroom dance if you want. You know what I mean? Like, I want to fucking rock climb. I want to do that shit. But you can't because when you're above the knee, you're missing two major joints. So you're missing your knee, your knee joint, and you're missing your ankle. So you're you're all fucked up in the game right now. So mm. so that's a different game. So when you see some of these people, you know, who are only missing below the knee, you know you should feel differently about them maybe than you do people that is missing all of it. You know, that's really interesting and that might have that might adjust how I treat some people onward. So you you know, you can't do half the shit. See all the people you see on the commercials and shit when they're running, those are all below the knee amputation motherfuckers. They they can still basically have the same lifestyle that they've been had. You know what I mean? Because they all they're missing is their ankle joint. And that's it. They're not missing their fucking knee. So you know, they don't go through half the, half the shit that we go through. Wow. Yeah, I guess if you're just missing that bottom part, you could throw a roller skate on there if you couldn't even afford, you know, some of these higher-end um, modes of transportation. Like, you're running on that $80,000 deal right there. Let's hear some more. Thanks for thanks for this info, Patrick. This is exactly what I was looking for, man, to just kind of get inside the mindset of what it's like to not have them. Onward. And on top of that, I want to talk to you about... Um, Remember, I told you now my leg just for walking is eighty grand. Okay, now let's say you want to go running. Those little things with little with little springy motherfucking legs. Mm -hmm. Those just to go running is a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I'm not bullshitting you. It's a hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and you can only use that to run. Wow. Wow, a hundred and twenty k to run. So, damn. Like you gotta really want to run. Like even it, like what if you don't have a leg and you're trying to hit your family up for Christmas? You're trying to get people to put in. You're trying to literally do a Kickstarter. I mean, that's a, dude. If you do a Kickstarter for a leg, that would trump the game because that is so ironic. And and you going for that? You got to really want to run because you're trying to get people to cough up that extra forty k. I mean, you they probably make you prove you want to run. You can't use that for anything else. So when you talk about people donate money, they're like, oh, I'd rather donate $120,000 to cancer research rather than give somebody one hundred and twenty grand just to take and run every now and again. You know what I'm saying? So when, they, when you think about that, people see that money, they're like, oh, he can he can only just use this to, to run? That's it? $120,000? That's a motherfucker's house down here in Mobile, Alabama. You know what I'm saying? Just to run? You talking about just to run? Playoffs? You talking about playoffs? I feel you, dude. That's right. That's true. You know, to be honest, if that's if I'm at the table and I got the checkbook and I'm looking at the dude and it's 80k to get him that regular leg, you know, so we can mill around and get to the mailbox, do basic shit, and he's trying to hit me up for that extra 40k just to run, and I don't even know this dude. I never seen no tapes of him. You know, I never seen him on like high school sports videos or anything like that. I gotta admit, it'd be hard for me to cough up that extra forty, man. Wow. 
So that's crazy because then it just comes down to a financial thing. And I wonder, do you feel less like the world doesn't care about you as much because, well, does insurance help? Let's, let, let's listen to some more. Sorry. Fuck out my face. They're not trying to hear you with that shit. You know, so it's, it's hard getting that money, you know. You know, and of course, fucking insurance. They don't want to pay for that shit. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I lost my shit because I had uh, cancer twice. So, you know. I'm 34 now, so if you had cancer twice before you, not even 40, shit, insurance, they don't want to pay for shit. So, yeah, it's rough out here in these streets, man, but, you know, still moving and shaking, still, you know, trying to keep up, man. But if you got any more uh, questions or anything like that, man, shit, let me know. Love the fucking comedy. I appreciate your shit, man. Respect, man. Wow. Wow. Thank you for the call, Patrick. Thank you for all that information um, to see that other side of what that's like, you know? Uh, it definitely makes me feel like I should have more gratitude for what I have going on. That's for sure. You know, for being biped right now or these two legged motherfuckers, as you call us, man, you know? Yeah, that must be crazy because you give anything to have that extra leg at certain moments, you know, to go for that jog. You probably see somebody out there with them one running on them, rolling on them 120s. That's $240, you know? And then insurance, yeah. If you had cancer under the age of 40, they're not betting that money on you. They're not going to be like, oh, this dude's a prime candidate to live long and to go for a nice run. This dude ain't going to be out there pre and you know. This ain't no Carl Lewis out there. So they're going to shut you down with some of that, some of those costs. Wow. Oh, it's a lot because then you just feel like a bill. You feel like an invoice running around at times. But to me, you're not, man. To me, dude, you're a brave, brave motherfucker. You sound tougher than me. That's for damn sure. Uh, and I would hate to fight you because you'd probably kick my ass. And I'd have to say that a dude with one leg kicked my ass, man. A guy with an $80,000 limb kicked my ass, man. But I can't say that if times didn't get tough, bro, that I wouldn't start capping on dudes that only have just that one that, that got that $80,000 limb. If there's a dark market for them, I can't say I wouldn't get involved in that, man, to be 100% honest with you. Can't say that I wouldn't. But thank you for calling about that, Patrick. I really appreciate it, man. That's a lot of insight, and and I'm grateful that you made that call. All right, let's jump into uh, another call right here. And this is going back into, uh, we, we had a follow-up episode this week about how women are the primary breadwinners. And uh, not yet, but it's statistically, that is where we are headed. And some of you guys are like, well, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, that's fine. You can feel that way. That's your reaction. That's how I felt at first. Like, well, what do you mean, man? I'm a man. We make money. You know, we, we are the breadwinners, you know? They, you know, women, uh, they do uh, their side. of They, they are the, the mothers, you know? And those are our, some of our innate jobs. But I'll tell you this. Statistically, women are taking, they're going to be making the bread. Because there are more women enrolled in undergraduate studies right now than men. Statistically, college graduates make more money than non-college graduates. On average, not saying for everybody, your case may be different. But that means that it is going to happen. Women at some point will become the primary breadwinners in families in America. And what does that look like for us? How do we deal with it? How do we react? People are like, well, how do you deal with it? Yeah, we can have a plan because we still want to be men. I still want to be a man. Okay, even if my wife is making more money than me or if I have a girl, I still want to be able to be a man. You know, in a society that sometimes I don't feel like they want us to be that anymore. So we need to figure that out, and we're figuring it out together. We got a call right here that came in. Let's jump on that. Hey, D boy, this is Steven. I'm sorry if it gets a little loud in here. I'm driving the old Red Bull truck. And here's what I think if. This is Steven, a Red Bull truck driver. Thank you for calling, Steven. Onward. Yeah. We're going to see women become the, the main breadwinners. At least, you know, most or some of them. I think you might see more men like myself get into creative line of work, you know. Who knows, if my fiancé was the breadwinner, I might be able to stop driving this damn truck right here and uh, in 15 years have that, that, that young Netflix money like, like my boy Theo over there. And uh, that's it. I was just thinking, like, man, I wish my fiancé did make more money or the same money as me 
and then I could, you know, maybe take a, a part-time job making a little less money and be able to, you know, go out there and do some creative work. Well, it's, I mean, this, see, and this is the kind of attitude and the kind of approach that I think is 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 uh, is positive, because here's the thing: if we if we, if we battle against this and it's going to happen, you can't fight some things, you know. And this is a logical, smart approach to take, and that's true. Maybe this is a time where men will be able to really flourish creatively. And that's a good thought, man, you know? And I respect you out there, man, running out there, running Red Bulls. Man, my mother uh, runs delivery. She delivers uh, papers. You know, newspapers always has my whole life, and I've helped her on her route many a times. I'm not saying um, paper's a lot less heavy than Red Bull, but uh, I appreciate what you do, man, and I appreciate your call, and I appreciate that attitude. And that'd be awesome, dude. Maybe we'll, maybe we will share a stage sometime. Let's hear the end of, uh, of what you call, Stephen. So that's it, man. I just think that, you know, if men didn't have to work as many hours, because uh, I work, you know, 60, 70 hours a week, that I'd be able to go and, and maybe draw a picture, man, or, um, you know, do a little stand-up at the open mics down there in NOLA. You know what I'm saying? But that's it, man. Have a great day. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for that call. Yeah, that's a great attitude, man. That's a great attitude. Maybe we will. Maybe it'll be more time for men to be creative. Well, I'd love to throw on a, honestly, dude, a damn nightgown, like a male nightgown with some room for it, maybe for some snacks or a couple of cigarettes, you know, and get out there and just be natural in the living room and, you know, just let the air conditioner just run up my skirt and just hit my nuts, bruh, and chill out, you know, and draw some pictures and do some painting. Maybe that is something we have ahead of us. That's a neat way to look at it. Let's take one more call. This is Sharon from Alabama. And I'm not going to get full bread into the rest of this, the, this, um, this conversation with the female breadwinners. But if you want to leave more, uh, more messages on the hotline about that, please do. Uh, I will do a follow-up episode about it. Or I might delve into it more next week in the regular episodes. Uh, the follow-up episodes usually come out on Thursday if we have them, and if if I can do it, you know, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a lot of work for me, and I am grateful to be able to do this, uh, but it does take a lot of time, and and also if I can keep my spirits up, it's easier for me to get out here and do it. So I hope that my spirits will be, you know, up this week. All right, let's take another call here. This lady called. I thought this was kind of interesting. I'm gonna play it for you really quick. This is Sharon from Alabama. Hey, CEO. Um, this is Sharon Brammer. Uh, I wanted to talk to you. I've been the primary breadwinner in our family for almost 40 years. And I would love to talk to you about how the men in my life have been so important in what they do and what they bring to the table. Um, If you would let me talk to you about that, uh, I would love to talk to you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. What a sweet lady. You can hear that, huh? That's a little bit of Southern uh, and Midwest hospitality right there. Uh, Well, look, Sharon, I'd love to talk to you about it. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to call the hotline back. Uh, That number is 985-664-9503 and leave me another voicemail. And just let me know what those men have done in your life that has been supportive or how it's helped you um, and what it's felt like to be the breadwinner. Um, You know, did you rub that in your husband's or your family member's face? How did they embrace that? Uh, I think, you know, we can probably learn some things from you, and I would appreciate it if you would call. Now, the voicemail can only go for three minutes, so if you have to talk longer than that, then hang up and call back. Uh, But that's how it works. And and I appreciate the calls, man. Patrick, I appreciate you calling and talking about the amputee. Uh, Man, on one leg, bro, you out there, you riding dirty, man, but I respect it. And I appreciate uh, the people at Calusa Casino. I'm glad I didn't take a walk to that parade because I might not be here. Because hitchhiking is dangerous. And I also thought about this, man. It's just a parting thought. You know, a lot of homeless out here where I live. And no, if somebody's homeless out there, uh, you know, more power to you getting a home. But I don't think the homeless should be allowed to just wander around all day. I think we should have hours where the homeless are out and about. Because the people who are with have homes and are doing work during the day, a lot of times traffic will get held up because there's two homeless dudes fighting in the street in a crosswalk. Or there's a homeless guy over there up off of Highland Avenue. All he does is go back and forth across the intersections all day. That guy alone is making people's commutes 20 minutes longer. And I just think 
if you're not contributing to the daily flow, then let's have some hours where you should be out and about. Because if you're out and about when people who are regular flow are out there doing it, you're not helping the situation, man. You're not helping the situation. I don't have any part in music for you guys this week. i got to look into some. I do have interest, though, if somebody wants to help, if, if somebody knows how to design an app, a basic app, I'm looking to hire somebody to help me do that. I'm also looking for some intro and outro, like kind of a theme music, you know, something that's kind of regular. Um, and I'm interested in that. I've had some music submissions, and maybe I'll look back through those. Uh, but those are things that I am interested in, uh, in getting some help with. And I want to thank you guys so much. I mean, I got, still have some great calls in the pen, and I'm going to get to some of those voice messages that you've left. And I'm going to make you a part of the show because I want you to be. And I'm grateful and I appreciate it, man. Um, thank you guys for bearing with me on this episode of This Past Weekend. Uh, the Patreon will come out this week, so that should be interesting. I think that's going to pop out on Wednesday. So hopefully that'll be all ready to rock for then on the 14th. And we can uh, start to offer some you know, unique stuff to big fans of the show and also create a little bit of money to help the show go smoother, get us some better cameras, um, you know, maybe get us into an environment where we could have a guest in a more comfortable environment, uh, hire a producer, uh, just little things like that. But I believe that we're doing good stuff, and I'm happy to be able to be um, a conduit uh, just to be a part of whatever, man. You know, And I appreciate you guys tuning in and listening to what's going on with me. Um, for this past weekend. I'm Theo Vaughn, man. Be good to yourselves. Uh, you probably deserve it. If you need me, hit the hotline, and I'll do what I can to help out. Or I'll try to, you know, just share. Let's share, man. Let's keep sharing this shit, dude. We're out here. All right. Bye-bye.